Hello everyone and welcome back to a new series in which I'm going to be looking at the entire reign of King Henry VII and this episode is going to be about how Henry VII came to power, the story of the Battle of Bosworth. So to understand the Battle of Bosworth we have to understand the Wars of the Roses which was the huge conflict that it essentially ended in 1485 and to understand this we have to first of all look at another war, the Hundred Years War, which were fought between England and France. So if we go back to 1429 you'll see that much of modern day France was actually controlled by the English, mostly thanks to the conquests of Henry V about a decade earlier. However, if we go forwards by almost 30 years to 1453, you'll see that all the English territory in France has been lost to the French, and this created a big issue. Now, as well as financial problems, it essentially left the English people with a very weak king, Henry VI, and he had certain people in his court who were his favourites, who were generally known as the Lancastrians, and others who he really didn't get on well with called the Yorkists, and eventually these two went into a civil war. Now, the reason there are these different groups is actually a lot more complicated, there are a lot of reasons for it, but the main reason is that there was a guy called the Duke of York, who was a descendant of Edmund of York, Edmund Langley, who was a son of Edward III, and then there were others who were the descendants of John of Gaunt, who was another son of Edward III, and his son, Henry Bolingbroke, had taken the throne back in around 1399. So it goes back, you don't really need to know too much about that, but essentially what's important is that there are two different groups, the Yorkists represented by the White Rose, the Lancastrians represented by the Red Rose, and they fought each other in the Wars of the Roses. And as this was going on, the French and the Burgundians also chose sides. So the French were mainly supportive of the Lancastrians, and the Burgundians were mainly supportive of the Yorkists during this conflict. Now if we look at the family tree, you'll see the aforementioned King Edward III, and this is important because remember that to be a king, not just anyone could become king, they had to be descended of another king or a royal family to have a claim. So if we look down the, the whole list of the different kings, there's John of Gaunt of the House of Lancaster, and the line continues. However, for Henry VII, his would be seen as a weaker claim, because as you can see, his mother is the reason why he can in in claim the throne, because she was Margaret Beaufort, daughter of John Beaufort, and all the way back to King Edward III. His father, Edmund Tudor, was actually related to Welsh princes of the time, but he was trying to take the throne of England. So his claim would be seen as weaker to others, which would be an issue, because if his wasn't the strongest, then other people might be able to claim the throne. But of course, at this stage, in the 1400s, the earlier 1400s, Henry didn't actually have a claim to the kingdom yet. He would have to fight and win this on the Battle of Bosworth. So if we look at the Wars of the Roses and look at the Winnometer, at first things don't really go well for the Yorkists at all. Richard Plantagenet, the Duke of York, and his son Edmund are both killed in the Battle of Wakefield and things are really looking down. But then his son just happens to be a tactical genius. He is Edward, going to be Edward IV when he captures the throne. And things seem to be going really well after he wins at the Battle of Tewkesbury and at the Battle of Mortimer's Cross, both in 1460 and 1461. However, his gold friend, the Warwick, the kingmaker he betrays him in 1469 and there is a reversal of power edward has to flee to the low countries and the lancastrians take power but then he's back again in 1471 he smashes the lancastrians both at the battle of barnet and at the battle of towton and once again the yorkists are in power and this time they're there to stay and edward rules until his death in 1483 and at this stage, his brother, Richard III, comes to the throne. And we're going to have a look at him now. Now, Richard III, as I said, was the dead king, Edward IV's brother. He was a very astute tactician and a successful soldier. He was involved in most of the battles of his brother as well, winning quite a couple of them. And before this, he was actually the Duke of Gloucester, which generally was a title given to the brother of the king. And there was a bit of controversy around Richard III, not going to go too much into that in this video, but essentially he is blamed, and I think he probably did, kill his nephews. Now, of course, Edward IV had two heirs, and they were called Edward and Richard, and they will be important for episode three of this series, so try and remember this, because his sons were the heirs to the throne, but obviously they were two young to rule. So he set up a regency council, which meant that the older people in the family would rule until they came of age. However, Richard III, by 
good means or bad means or whether he was pressured into it or not actually sent them to the tower which misconception is that the tower was a prison it was actually a royal residence at this time but essentially he put them up in the tower and then he was declared king instead of them in 1483. Now if we look at Henry VII, who of course at this time wasn't yet Henry VII, he was Henry Tudor, the Earl of Richmond, but he would become Henry VII. He was the son of a deceased Lancastrian lord called Edmund Tudor, but he was taken in by his uncle called Jasper at Pembroke Castle, which was the new family seat in southwestern Wales. His claim to the throne was weak. But at the time after the battles of Towton, for example, and Barnet, the last Lancastrians from the actual Lancastrian line had been wiped out. So they then had to go to the next nearest line, which was the Tudor line through Margaret Beaufort. Now, Henry had actually grown up in exile because his uncle Jasper had actually fled the country with Henry after the defeats at Tewkesbury because he thought there would be a, a, a Yorkist repercussion against Lancastrian lords, which might have been a sensible thing. Now we have to look at Buckingham's rebellion. And this was caused because of Richard III's high-handed actions in getting rid of his nephews, because Edward IV was a much-loved king, especially by certain Yorkist nobles who did not like the fact that Richard had got rid of the nephews, the rightful king to the throne of England when they came of age, and they rebelled against this in October 1483. And as well as this, of course, because now the Yorkists were divided, it meant that they had um, Lancastrians supporting them as well. And that rose on the other side should be white. Apologies about that. And actually, the plot of Buckingham's Rebellion, which was led by a guy called the Duke of Buckingham, was to get Henry Tudor over from France, or he was actually hiding in Brittany at the time, which was then an independent duchy, was to get him over from there and then to crown him as the rightful king. And Henry Tudor actually did try and cross the channel with a fleet of ships from Brittany in 1483, but he was pushed back by a storm in the channel. And actually, Buckingham's rebels, there was a huge storm and this affected the rivers and the contact between the rebel armies in England and when the Duke of Buckingham knew that the royal army under Richard was coming they panicked they broke and he tried to get away disguising himself but he was captured and beheaded and the rebellion crumbled and as well actually Henry Tudor almost died even though he never left Europe or never got to England I should say because the Duke of Brittany his uh, prime minister actually tried to have him handed over but he faked stomach cramps at the last minute and was able to flee to France which was more pro-Lancastrian this is also important because in France he was at the royal court and while at the French royal court which was more sophisticated at the time than the English royal court he learned how the French did politics and this was going to give him a huge advantage when he was actually ruling over England as well and you see quite a lot of new modern ideas which were quite commonplace in some of the higher ranking courts in Europe being introduced under Henry the seventh and this is directly thanks to his time in Europe at the royal courts of others so now we go to the year 1485 and this is the year in which Henry decides to make his move on the English crown. Now with French support and actually a great deal, a few thousand French troops as well as some Scottish troops because of course the French and the Scottish were in the old alliance together and there were actually quite a few thousand Scottish troops in French service at the time. He crossed over the channel and landed in Wales. There he met up with Rhys ap Thomas and met the Royal Army at a place in Leicester called Bosworth, or I should say Leicestershire, and the reason he landed in Wales was because of this Welsh descent, and he got a lot of support. Now, he had to make sure that while he was going as fast as possible, because he thought his best bet was to kill Richard in battle and then take the crown, because he was outnumbered massively, even at Bosworth. Richard had a lot more men, Richard III. He was the King of England, let's not forget. And it was essentially Henry's plan to go fast enough to destroy him, but slow enough that men could join his banner. And essentially his timing was almost perfect in this sense. So let's have a look at the forces that were arrayed against him. So King Richard III's forces to begin with, he had a force of mainly infantry, around 3,000 in number, but he has more in support. Now many of the nobles supporting Richard were not really big fans of Richard and I'm sorry if any of you are Ricardians but there's not really another way of saying this because he actually had taken several of the nobles children as hostages as sureties 
that they would be loyal and they wouldn't turn on him, as this happened a lot during the Wars of the Roses, that various people turned on each other, and spoiler alert, it's going to happen again. His flanks were supported by the Earl of Northumberland on the left and the Earl of Norfolk on the right, and there was also another army there. Now if you look at Northumberland's forces, he is, um, I believe it's Henry Percy, he is the Percy family actually built the castle in my village, so a little bit of a connection there, um, and he deployed on the flank of Richard's army, I believe it was the right flank of Richard's army, and he mostly had cavalry from the north which were used for chasing down fleeing Scots most of the time, um, and his father had been a loyal Lancastrian, so on the other side of the combat, but he had actually been killed in battle. And he had only actually sworn fealty to Edward IV to the first Yorkist king in 1469, which wasn't that long ago all told, although now obviously he was in Richard's army, Yorkist Richard. So this is the third army at Bosworth, because it's actually very interesting. There were three armies at Bosworth rather than two, and this was the army of the Stanley brothers, William and Thomas and they had at various points supported either the Yorkists or the Lancastrians during the Wars of the Roses. And actually, I can't remember which one was which, but one supported the Yorkists from the start and the other the Lancastrians. But then they sort of went with which way the wind was blowing, which was quite a clever thing to do, because obviously things changed hands a lot during the various ups and downs for both factions during the wars. Now, a personal connection was that Thomas Stanley was married to Margaret Beaufort, who was Henry Tudor's mother because obviously Edmund Tudor had actually died three months before Henry was born, so this meant that Margaret Beaufort could marry again. So there was this family connection there. And actually the Stanleys held secret talks with Henry Tudor several days before the battle, sending messages, and they actually met the day before the battle to discuss things, but no one knows what was exchanged between the two, so it was really all to play for. However, there was a counterbalance to this, which was that Richard III had William Stanley's young son, who was Lord Strange, as a hostage to act as a surety. So that was then another dynamic to be factored into the equation. Now finally we have Henry Tudor's forces. Now he had a few hundred to a few thousand Welsh and Englishmen who joined him in exile mostly after Buckingham's rebellion went tits up um, and they crossed the channel, they fled and joined him there. But the majority of his troops were actually French or Scottish with a large troop of Welshmen as well because obviously he was Welsh and had come through Wales on the way to the battlefield. And actually it was recorded that the, the king obviously gave Henry Tudor the worst troops in France so it was a really uh, a rowdy lot but they were after all professional troops. Um, as well as this obviously he had troops under the Welshman Chris Ap Thomas who um, is, was one of my childhood heroes actually to divulge a little bit is that I used to live in the West Country which is where I was actually born so that's Somerset and obviously Somerset isn't too far from Wales and my dad actually because I was obsessed with knights as a little kid my dad got me a little um, postcard of Chris Ap Thomas on a horse um, in you know the full regalia of the Wars of the Roses kind of armour style and actually when on the way when I was moving house from Somerset to to Northumberland where I now live we we passed Bosworth the battlefield and actually went to Bosworth and uh, you know I think I can't remember I, w I was definitely Rhys Ap Thomas and I think I made my dad be uh, Richard III and I obviously slayed him rightly um, but yeah that's a, that's a little um, personal divulging from the story there so I have sort of a yeah I've always been interested in this period I don't know why it's taken me this long to make a, a uh, video about it but anyway he has several thousand troops under the Welshman uh, Chris Ap Thomas who is this nobleman who uh, c who collected a lot of men in Wales before and also several thousand Englishmen under John de Vere who was the Earl of Oxford and he I should point out as well as Chris Ap Thomas both of those were very experienced commanders military commanders they'd fought in several battles in the Wars of the Roses whereas Henry was relatively inexperienced, which is a huge contrast to Richard III, who was very much experienced. He had fought in a lot of different battles, and successfully so, during the Wars of the Roses. So, some of the key geography to sort of lay it out is that Richard III and his main cohort of men were on a hill called Ambien Hill, and he was uh, protected on the one side, obviously on the one flank, by the Duke of Norfolk, and on the other flank by the Duke of Northumberland. Although Northumberland was on a hill or a little bit behind 
Richard III, and there is still the question as to whether he could have moved troops in to help Richard should the need arise. Spoiler alert. And of course you have the third army, the Stanley's army, uh, not too far away but definitely detached from Richard's army, and they were essentially watching to see what would happen down below. So the battle gets underway and first we see that Henry sends in John de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, with a few thousand men and they engage the Earl of Norfolk and they start fighting it out in the centre at the base of Ambien Hill at the time. Now I've depicted them mostly as knights, there would be billmen, there would be uh, lower class infantry and archers played a huge role uh, as well as cannon on Richard III side as well as Henry's side but I you know, I don't have a, a huge budget for these videos, so I I just make the knights, and uh, I think they look pretty nice, so, you know, that's fine. Um, and then, as well, we ha he sends in Stanley. He tells Stanley to get involved because his troops are being beaten back, but Stanley refuses. He then threatens Stanley with taking off his son's head, who, of course, Lord Strange, he has him hostage, but Stanley says, eh, can't be bothered anyway. So, Richard actually orders his men to kill the son, but they are obviously too busy fighting and actually they don't end up killing Lord Strange at the time, uh, which annoys Richard III. And of course, we then have the other dynamic, which is that Henry Tudor was also in contact with the Stanleys. And he then urges the Stanleys to get involved as well, to help out, because Henry is outnumbered. He's at the bottom of the hill, Richard's at the top of the hill, Richard has reinforcements on all sides. So Henry needs a quick victory. And the way to do this is Stanley's. They are the third army. Of course, if he can swing the third army, then he might have a chance of winning, but not necessarily. So at the foot of Ambien Hill, things are going badly for Richard's men, and Henry's men seem to be making a headway and pushing the Duke of Norfolk back. Now at this time, Richard III signals for Northumberland to get involved, but for whatever reason, Northumberland doesn't do anything. Now there's a huge debate as to whether the Duke of Northumberland actively told his men, nope, don't do it, don't move in, just stay here, or whether because of his location, he couldn't send his men forward, that Richard's men on the hill were blocking his men, or that the geography didn't allow it, and that he physically couldn't move his men in. It's a big debate, but I personally think he probably saw the way in which the wind was blowing, thought the Stanleys, they're probably not going to go with us, and that he decided not to send his men in, uh, not to hedge his bets on a dying horse. Now it's at this point that Richard III is very desperate because his men, obviously they aren't doing what they are told, so his worst nightmare we, and he did actually have nightmares before the battle, which were of uh, the his troops betraying him, were coming true. So in a very rash move, he sees that because Henry has sent in his army, he is pretty much with a small group of French knights of retainers, and with his essentially his entourage, he is alone on one side of his army. So Richard takes a very rash move and charges in on horseback, and my drawing skills, though they are improving, are not quite good enough to draw horseback charges. So in this one, they're charging in on foot. And actually, he kills some of the close men to Henry, to his standard bearer, for example. Uh, he actually kills him with his lance on horseback. And again, I think, because all the bad press that Richard III gets, the man had huge balls. He charged into the middle of Henry's formation on horseback with only his close household cavalry, his household guard of 20-30 men against into he the side of Henry's army to go and kill him. So whatever you say about Richard III, I have respect for the man um, that he did charge in and it says something about his warlike and his heroic nature in a way. Um, and actually Henry at one point comes very close to being taken down by Richard and various French knights at the time actually said that Henry got off his horse and took off uh, you know, his, um, his royal regalia and tried to blend in with the troops so that he wouldn't be cut down, which was a sensible move, but maybe not the most heroic one. And Richard came very close to actually killing Henry Tudor, but at that moment his men crowded around him, others came back and forced the Richard III and his men back. And they were obviously in heavy plate armor, they were on horses at, at the time, uh, so it was the momentum of the charge that counted, and they were being, obviously, if they were being forced back, then they were away from Henry Tudor, and the whole idea of the charge had been to charge in, kill the king, uh, 
well, they, well, they cut off his head. I mean, it's not very chivalrous, but the Wars of the Roses are famous for their brutality. So something like that to show Henry's men that he was dead. Because obviously, without Henry Tudor, the Lancastrians didn't have a claimant for the throne, and Richard would be safe. So essentially, the aim of both sides was to kill the king. It's actually like a game of chess, actually. Yeah, they're not too bothered about killing all the other knights. It's about the kings, very much so in this case. Because without the king, well, that's the only reason they're fighting. Because Richard didn't have a son who was going to inherit. If Richard died, that was the, the end for him. If Henry died, that was the end for the Lancastrians. There was literally no one else coming for the throne. Henry was the last hope of the Lancastrians. And it's at this point, Richard being pushed back from his last diehard charge into an area of marshy ground. It's at this point where Shakespeare describes him as being unhorsed and then he says, My horse, my horse, a kingdom for a horse. But this probably didn't happen. This is probably more classic Shakespeare bullshit, um, which I think it probably is. But it's at this point that Richard III is indeed killed, struck down um, in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And actually, when they did find his body in a car park a few years ago in Leicester, which was the huge news a while, about, a while back, um, they did actually find he had lots of cut wounds, slash wounds to the skull, uh, to the back, and they, I think they worked out that this wasn't sort of that he was on the ground, he was dead, and that they'd just gone, aha, you'd, you know, make a few notches in your cranium. But, you know, this was actually in the fighting that it had happened when he was still alive, that he was being, you know, and actually um, there's a very interesting documentary about the Battle of Towton, where they look at some of the bodies, which is the bloodiest battle of the um, Wars of the Rose, I think something like, 10 to 20,000 men died on one day, which is incredible. It was like the Battle of the Somme, but then in, you know, the 1400s, at least by proportion. I think something ridiculous, like 5% of the the um, the the youth died on one day in medieval England. It's incredible. But anyway, that's, that's definitely for another video. But uh, yeah, and they actually found Richard III's skeleton in a car park, under a car park in Leicester, I think in 2015. Um... So yeah, and obviously after the battle, Richard III is dead, and I should also mention actually that while Richard charged in, this was the point where the Stanleys charged in, but to help out King Henry, and it's actually the Stanleys who help to bolster Henry's position, and they then charge in. Obviously Richard III's army was already in retreat, the Northumberland's troops hadn't actually committed, uh, and the Earl of Oxford was handing uh, the Earl of o Norfolk's uh, troops you know, a, a battering in the centre. And at this point, the army collapses and they retreated the Yorkist army, the Royalist army. And Henry is now the King of England, King Henry the Seventh. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you have indeed enjoyed the first part of my series about Henry the Seventh, who ruled from 1485, the Battle of Bosworth, to 1509. Now, as I said, I'm going to be including sort of all the major parts of his reign in a video series. I'm not sure exactly how long it's going to be. I already have parts two and three worked out, um, and then I'll make some more after this. And as well, I will be returning to a lot of these issues in separate videos, so I'll do one on the Battle of Bosworth and on whether the Richard III deserves his kind of treatment and the Battle of Towton, you know, the Wars of the Roses, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for watching, I hope you've enjoyed, and don't forget to leave a thumbs up, comment anything below, and share if you would be so kind. Thanks very much, I'm History with Hill.